Now, this is where we're going to have what I would call, quote, fun. And this is how we're also going to continue. I'm going to continue um, to plow through the show without too long of diatribes and tangents. It's by knowing that I have a bunch of clips that I want to show and react to. And I also want to eat dinner. <laughs> so this is where we're going to go speed round of the Republican tomfoolery medley. Uh, this is going to start with something that we didn't talk about in previous episode um, when we were when we were talking about George Santos. I'll just say that um, he has been caught in a number of lies, lying about his Jewish heritage, lying about going to college, lying about being in on the volleyball team at college, lying about working for Citibank, lying about um, his mom being in New York City. That came out today on 9-11. Uh, the list kind of goes on and on and on. Uh, not ever disclosing that he was married previously, even though he is admittedly gay, um, which, again, we've talked about in the previous episode. They're not mutually exclusive, um, but to not you know, ever mention it in two congressional campaigns is kind of out there. Now, the one thing that everybody was saying uh, in reaction to all of this was he can't possibly be lying about his own name, could he? And this is where those people... Are potentially, because like all these other things, nobody actually knows who this guy is, which is a problem. Nobody knows where this guy got his money, which is a problem. Nobody knows what this guy's real name is. Here's a clip from 2019 where George Santos, Republican elected congressperson who has committee seats, by the way, introducing himself at a Brandon Straka who started this organization called Walk Away, which is which is a thing that he did with Candace Owens and a bunch of other right wingers to walk away from the Democratic Party. He is at an event. I, he's in the crowd with that guy. And uh, you'll see Blair uh, Blair White, who is a uh, right wing trans um, anti trans person anti-LGBTQ uh, person, ant racist person, etc. Um, at this event, introducing himself, not as George Santos, but as Anthony DeVolder. Yeah, we're the haters. Oh, you gotta be here. So my name is Anthony DeVolder. Um, I'm a New York City resident. I have recently founded a group called United for Trump, so if you guys want to follow... That would be awesome. My question's directed for both Blair and um, there he is. Brandon. Well, Brandon. This is your guy. This is Anthony DeVolder. George Anthony DeVolder Santos. There he is. He started United for Trump, which is also, which I, I, I the, the question here is not going to really matter. What matters here is that he lied. On top of this, I want to see, hold on, let me make sure that I, I don't know if I pulled any tweets for this um because remember my medley is quite expansive here um oh so here is the article from the washington post talking about how george santos has, has previously stated that his mother was inside one of the world trade center towers on 9 11 but immigration records indicate that santos mother wasn't in the united states on that day liar um also pointed out in chat yeah he said that he was jewish he wasn't Jewish. He was Jew-ish. Um, oh, man. Oh, here it is. Okay. This is a clip of Anthony DeVolder's <laughs> George Santos. George, An George Anthony DeVolder Santos, his former roommate who knew him as Anthony DeVolder, 
talking about a scam that Sir Anthony pulled while he was his roommate. How long did you actually live together? We were only uh, roommates for a few months, and I also knew him as uh, Anthony Zabrowski. So you knew. So not only was he Anthony Devolder, he was Anthony Zabrowski. Now, maybe that plays into the Jewish. So sometimes he might be Jewish, and sometimes he might be Italian, and sometimes he might be who knows. Hispanic. Uh, he, sometimes he might just be regular white guy. Sometimes he might just be some, you know, alien species. Who knows? But George Zabrowski, now he has a different plan for what he wants to do in this world. He, he, why did he say he had two names then? Well, he, he used Zabrowski for his uh, Friends of Pets United, his, um, uh, his GoFundMe. And he would say, oh, well, you know, the, the Jews will give more if you're a Jew. And so that's the name he used for his GoFundMes. And what was he having? Not even phased, by the way. Not phased whatsoever. I mean, GoFundMes for back then. Uh, his, he had a uh, pet charity, Friends of Pets United. Uh, Friends of Pets United. It was supposedly to um, help out with, you know, sick animals and Dogs. things like that. There's actually um, just an article released from um, uh, one of my reporters uh, who's been interviewing me a lot, uh, Jacqueline Sweet, about how he conned a, a homeless military vet out of $3,000 for his uh, service dog. So for those who don't know that story... George Anthony Zabrowski Devalder Santos um, conned a military veteran out of $3,000 using a GoFundMe to utilize the person's status as a homeless person to raise money to help the dog that the person had get to a vet. And then once the money was raised, he told the guy that the money... Uh, or sorry, that the dog could not be helped and thus he is not giving him the money and he scammed that person. This is Republicans letting this guy take the seat in Congress. This is the New York Democratic Party failing over and over again. Now, maybe it's because nobody knew who George Santos was. They were looking for Anthony DeValder or Anthony Zabrowski or George Zabrowski or George DeValder something, some combination, who knows what his real name is. This is the absurdity of letting this guy take a seat in the House of Representatives. This is the absurdity of the Republican Party at this point. What the hell is going on in this party? So I'm going to go to the next part of our medley here, and that is the potential challenger to Donald Trump for the presidency of the United States, Ron DeSantis, and I'm going to read this tweet one for one for you. Um, those, and, and I'm going to preface this, those of you that have any interest in education, any interest in history, any interest in African-American history, any interest in, in world history, any in interest in educating the youth past a Eurocentric viewpoint of the world, any interest in looking at the world in any other way other than your own viewpoint are going to laugh, scoff, be angry, be sad at this because, but, but you're not going to be surprised because governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis has blocked the AP African American history course from being taught in Florida schools, citing that it is quote, significantly or that it significant quote significantly lacks educational value <sighs> so what happens here and for those who may be of uh, an older generation that didn't go to school um and i don't know how it was you know 30 40 years ago but ap classes are college level courses that you can take in high school and they can count towards college Credits. So as a way to save money, first of all, but second of all, to actually have a furthering of your education in high school beyond just the, 
Here is a map of the world. Can you point out where Zimbabwe is? Here is a uh, textbook about World War II. Who is Hirohito? And like, not, you know, th that stuff's important. But diving deeper into certain things and looking at the aspects of history and the aspects through a different lens, some might say a critical lens, uh, and that's where this lies is um, that's where it catches his attention is because this would be critical race theory, 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 where if you look at the world through any lens other than a straight white man from a 50 year old man's perspective like DeSantis, then it is critical race theory and we have to strike it down because God forbid we teach kids what happened in this country and how, uh, frankly, African Americans were brought to this country and what three, 400 years, 350, 400 years of slavery did. That is a part of our history and we have to be able to address it and look at it. And African American history, by the way, isn't just the history of slavery. You can look at heroes of history through an African-American lens. It doesn't have to be bad. This is what's crazy. You can learn about people like MLK in an unfiltered fashion, because remember that Martin Luther King Day was this week, where every Republican wanted to wrap themselves in the I have a dream speech. But they would <laughs> conveniently leave out the democratic socialist values that MLK had and why he was assassinated right after protesting uh, for Vietnam, against Vietnam, the Vietnam War, and protesting uh, to help sanitation workers unionize and get better wages and better representation and get people of color into the unions that way they, fe they previously were not allowed to be into. Oh, but of course we can't teach African-American history because that's spooky. You can't teach about Malcolm X and MLK and their co their conflicting ideas and what came out of that and how in in you could you can't even talk about how Malcolm X in his autobiography wrote about how he was sitting with uh, Coretta Scott um, uh, King and talking about how he needed Martin Luther King the same way that Martin Luther King needed him. They played off of each other in a certain way and they built towards something bigger. Because of their personas. You can't talk about Fred Hampton being assassinated because that's critical race theory. And you can't talk about it all because the triggered right wingers will do this. Now, of course, I can't have only one critical race theory uh, spooky. Uh, I have to go to this bozo in Arkansas. And yes, I do mean bozo because Mike Huckabee was an absolute bozo but this is sarah huckabee sanders mike huckabee's daughter who is now the and it, remember this was the donald trump press secretary who li blatantly lied day in day out to the american people in arkansas home of former president bill clinton talking about critical race theory and banning it preemptively in arkansas Partial about the fact that you're now growing up in the house, or your kids will grow up in the house where you grew up. Now that you're the governor, you have a different bedroom this time around, but it sounds like your daughter is going to grow up in this space. You did as well. Um, you hit the ground running this week after your inauguration. A number of executive orders. Um, some folks love them. Some folks do not. Let's talk about your critics' uh, reaction to some of these orders. One of them is called Executive Order to Prohibit Indoctrination and Critical Race Theory in Schools. Uh, the House Minority Leader there in Arkansas, a Democrat, says this. We can't support our teachers if we alienate and insult them with headline-grabbing executive orders. She says CRT is not. Wow, this this almost sounds like the exact same thing that would have probably been written about the Central Bucks School District here in Bucks County, which is supposed to be a great school district. Not being taught in Arkansas schools. Axios seems to back her up. They said reality check. There's no indication that the college level course is taught in any Arkansas public school. So if that's. Yeah, see, not taught in Arkansas public schools. Remember that African-American History is also not critical race theory, by the way. Critical race theory is its own an analysis of the world through 
critical theory utilizing race as the lens. They're not the same thing. That's true. Why the executive order? It's incredibly important that we do things to protect the students in our state. We have to make sure that we are not indoctrinating our kids and that these policies and these ideas never see the light of day. We should never teach our kids to hate America or that America is a racist and evil country. In fact, it should be the exact opposite. We know for a fact that the Federal Department of Education issued CRT guidance and policies to every school district in the country. Our job is to Where? protect the students, and we're going to take steps every single day to make sure we do exactly that. And that's the reason I signed the executive order. I'm proud of the fact that we're taking those steps, and we're going to continue to do it every single day that I'm in office. Can so here's the thing. Indoctrination would not be teaching kids what has happened, what has not happened in this country. Indoctrination would not be looking at the Reagan presidency with a critical eye and saying, hey, maybe some of this supply side economics is kind of hogwash. Maybe looking at you know, I'll, I'll even say, even at uh, my in my grad school in economics class, we're talking about. I have an economics class uh, with application to public policy. We talk about the sup the surplus under Bill Clinton, and maybe as a high school student, you should learn that a government, a federal government, specifically the United States, running a surplus is not necessarily the best thing for an economy. You can learn that stuff in a in in a classroom setting it doesn't mean that you hate capitalism it doesn't mean that you hate the america it doesn't mean that you're grooming or indoctrinating kids to a certain ideological perspective all that it means is you, you are teaching them what happened in this country or you're teaching them about policy or you're teaching them with some sort of application indoctrination is blindly following and you know giving your allegiance to a nationalist ideology that is indoctrination and saying cr uncritically that uh oh i just love um everything about america without criticism without any sort of uh, perspective that says we you know what this is why i this is why i get so mad about this stuff is because as a patriotic progressive I believe that America is great, but we should be doing greater things. We should not be striving to be a uh, 200th place. We shouldn't be striving to be 10th place in, 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 you know, when we come into these healthcare analyses and there's 14 countries. We shouldn't be when we're looking at 14 countries' systems. We shouldn't be aiming to be 14th. We should be aiming to be first we should be looking to be the best at education the best at healthcare the best at reducing wealth inequality that is what we should want to do you should be proud of yourself for trying to make your country better and trying to help uh your fellow countrymen and trying to help young kids learn about the past because if you don't know about the past you are doomed to repeat it and that is what these folks don't care to talk about or address because they don't believe that it matters. They don't believe that the history of Jim Crow matters. They don't believe that the Tulsa race riots matter. They don't believe that the internment camps with Japanese people matter. They don't want you to know about any of this stuff. I mean, FDR is my favorite president. I should still know about that stuff during World War II. Like, that is vital to really understanding how we uh, engage and interact with the world around us, social media, current events, the news, politics, history, all intertwines. So this BS about indoctrination in, in, in schools is not even, it's not even close to happening. You could talk about in college, but at least in college there's choice in, high, in, in what classes you take and there's choices in what majors you take because I can tell you that going to a business school, it is not a liberal haven of just Oh, actually, Karl Marx is great. Like, dude, I went to business school. Step out of your bubble, your elitist bubble, uh, 
of being on Fox News and engage, engage with regular people that go to school, that go to college, that go to high school, that are working working in middle schools, uh, working in elementary schools, etc. They're not teaching. This is the same thing with um, sex ed. I mean, I, I hosted an, uh, an educational event last week with a group called Advocates for Inclusive Education around the what's happening in Central Buck School Board. And people asked about what happens with uh, sex ed and how it applies to potential other curriculums. And one of the people that was a volunteer for the Dole on Democrats actually was talking about when she was an elementary school teacher, which wasn't that very long. Well, it wasn't very long ago. They adjust age wise the curriculum, specifically something like sex ed and saying like, hey, if you're in elementary school, you teach kids that they shouldn't be uh, touched in places where they would have a bathing suit. It's like the basis of teaching kids um, what is right and what is wrong. Because if they can't identify something that is wrong, then when they get older, how are they supposed to engage in reality and engage in the real world and protect themselves, protect each other, protect their kids? I mean, it seems simple. So I don't understand... I don't understand uh, the the level of just like blatant disregard and and um, unscr- unscrutiny, I should say. I don't know, but here is all right. Now we're gonna talk. We're not. We're gonna move away from culture because remember the Republicans are fighting culture wars against imaginary um, flying Dutchmen, and. Now, because the Republicans control the the, uh, House of Representatives, now we have some people that are empowered that want to really stick it to people. Uh, Those grumpy old men and old women that want, ew, you want Social Security? What are you, some sort of liberal? Here is Republican representative that wants to raise the retirement age for people to qualify for social security and then they want to cut social security because this is a way to cut social security because quote we want they they the, these people want to work more what well, reason the age of retirement you know uh that's interesting uh that you asked that question uh this is representative rick allen from georgia come up to me they actually don't work more. Mm-hmm. yeah he so, said they actually want to work longer. That's on the table, you're saying? Well, you know, uh, if people want to work longer, maybe you need to give them an incentive to do it. Okay. Yeah, that's the way to solve every one of these problems, by the way. I know, I know. And actually, uh, grow wealth at the same time. Mm-hmm. It just takes that right there. So he said, he said, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it exactly. Uh, oh, well, I know. He said, I know, I know. He said, to get, this is a way to give them, meaning these lazy old people that want to retire, because God forbid anybody wants to retire. It's not like it's not like you work for 50 years of your life and you deserve to retire. Not in, not in Rick Allen's view, not in Rick Allen's America. You shouldn't. This is what I'm talking about when I talk about they don't want better for uh, younger generations. They don't want even the same. For younger generations, the baby boomers are on their way into retirement. Gen X is not going to be able to retire until they're seven in their 70s. Millennials are not going to we're not we're probably never going to get to retire. Gen Z, dude, you're going to be working. You're you're going to have like a uh, probably some sort of processor hooked up to your corpse, making sure that you can work after you die. Like this is the type of stuff that they want out of people rather than saying, hey, maybe Social Security we could give it to everybody that wants it at the re- regular age because we could just um, raise the cap on it, lift the cap entirely on it, and then you can fund it indefinitely. There's never going to be a problem ever again because remember that there is a regressive tax on Social Security. So this is what the Republicans want. So how do you fund? How do you fund this? Well, here is a House Republican bill. That is proposing to, oh, that's way too big, Um, proposing to apply a, not a 5%, not a 7%, which I believe is what the uh, Pennsylvania sales tax is, not a 10%, not a 15%, not a 20%, not a 25%, 
a 30% sales tax on food, gas, medical care, which is already, not, yeah, it's not expensive enough. Rent, which is definitely not expensive enough. And of course, you, you my eyes couldn't roll around in my head to e exemplify how ludicrous this is. And everything else for uh, a 30% tax, where the Republican is quoted as saying, if you don't want to pay for it, don't buy it. Now, of course, this won't ever pass. A 30% sales tax will never pass. Um, but this is the type of policy that we're dealing with. Economic policy like this is regressive. Now, I'm going to quit. I will quickly go over some regressive policy because just be just so we know what we are dealing with. The reason why a 30% sales tax is regressive is because 30% on top of food or rent or gas are necessities for American people. Now, if something's a necessity, that means it is probably a priority in your spending habits. So there is, and we've talked about it before. I'm sure I'll talk about it again. I'm talking about it in my book. There's almost a whole chapter around this type of wealth inequality uh, issue. The marginal propensity to consume. It is on a scale from zero to one, although technically speaking, and again, this is, I'm not an economist, but this is uh, my interpretation of this. Technically speaking, a marginal propensity to consume can go over one because if you go into debt, you're technically spending more than you have. But zero meaning that you can, if you made $100, you spent zero of it. If you or a one, which is if you made a hundred dollars, you spent a hundred, a whole hundred dollars. The lower you are on the income distribution, the higher, most likely, the higher your marginal propensity to consume is because you have less income. Thus, you have to spend more of your income to live. So, if your rent is fifteen hundred dollars a month, which is pretty low compared to a lot of places across this country at this point. If it's 1500 and there was a 30% tax on it, or you have to spend $150 on groceries every two weeks, and there's a 30% sales tax on it, because remember that sales tax doesn't necessarily apply to certain necessities like food or clothing in certain places. Again, that's state by state, but this would be a federal one on top of the state ones. Um, this is where the regressiveness hits because a 30% tax on uh, food would be, okay, if you make $40,000, 30% on what you buy would disproportionately be a larger percentage of your income than if you were, say, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, uh, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett. Or if you just drop it down a notch, maybe not billionaire, let's go to athletes, LeBron James, uh, go to Alex Rodriguez. I don't know. Just keep going down the income distribution. You go to actors, these people that are, that have money. They're not impacted by it because they spend what they, what they have because they, they just have it. Their marginal propensity to consume is lower because their overall income is higher. If you have 10 million, if you, if you have $10 billion, your marginal pro to propensity to consume is logistically next to impossible to be one because you can't possibly spend that much money without being like, oh, I'm going to buy the internet like Elon Musk is trying to do, right? Like you to spend that amount of money would and it, it wouldn't necessarily be consumption at that point either. So this is the type of policy we're getting from Republicans in response to uh, inflation, in response to, uh, frankly, a decent economy other than the inflation, which inflation is slowing. The deficit got cut, which nobody talks about. The deficit that the Republicans always complain about is lower than it was under Trump. So, you know, again and again and again and again and again, uh, this stuff is just, you know, smacked down. Um, by, um, sorry, I'm, I'm searching for something that I want to share with you all before. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, basically it is just 
nonsense. The Republicans have no policy, and um, it is just a a sham, honestly, at this point, that we are dealing with these kind of ludicrous proposals.